please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Kelly Corrigan. So I have to be honest, I'm not feeling very good about my prospects right now. I don't have a ukulele player. I don't have a beret. I can't do that dance that that guy did from the gospel. And I'm the last thing between you and your five o'clock drink. <laughs> Let me give you five facts. 33% of high school graduates never read a book after graduation. In college, the number goes to 42%. When the state of Arizona forecasts how many beds they need for their prisons, they look to the number of kids in fourth grade who read well. The number one cause of divorce is poor communication, and the number one predictor of occupational success is vocabulary. So my message today for individuals and couples and families, for workforces, electorates, and communities is read more. Read personal narrative, read poetry, read op-ed, read Doris Kearns Goodwin and Louisa May Alcott and Captain Underpants. <laughs> there are so many good reasons to read. There's a whole set of physiological benefits, similar to what you get from meditation, so there's lowered stress and deeper sleep and reduced memory loss. And then there's the places that a book can take you that time and money and reality sometimes prohibit, like Xerox Park or Gosford Park or Jurassic Park. And then there are the people that you can meet in the pages of a book. You know, you can walk the jungle with Colonel Kurtz or skip to the tea party with the Mad Hatter or storm the boardroom waving a tiny phone with Steve Jobs. <laughs> Reading is the ultimate neurobiological workout. It is to the brain what exercise is to the body. I could stop right there and the case for reading would be made, but there's another reason that I want to talk about today, and that is to read for the words. The consequences of a robust working vocabulary seem small, but they're actually many and meaningful. Before I get to them, let me just make the link quickly between reading and vocabulary. After fourth grade, your vocabulary basically develops exclusively from reading, and that's because written language is so much more diverse than spoken conversation. If you were to read for 30 minutes a day for a year, you would be exposed to two million words used in context. And they say conservatively that 5% of those words would be new to you or unfamiliar or rarely used words. So that's 100,000 such words that you're gonna see in a year. Let's say you only retain 100. But let's also say that you're not one of the 33 percent of the high school graduates who never read another book again, and let's also say that you're getting ready to go to your 30-year reunion, that means that you have been exposed to thousands of new words and you've incorporated them into your own personal arsenal. That has, that matters, that adds up. So as I said at the top, one of the things it does for us is predict occupational success, and it's been proven that the achievement precedes the vocabulary rather than being a result of. And at first it seemed so far-fetched to me that that would be the case, but then it seemed so obvious the more I sat with it. I mean, how we communicate has such a huge influence over how we're perceived, and how we're perceived has such a huge influence over how we behave, and how we behave over time becomes basically who we are to our colleagues and within our profession. And it all starts with word choice. Two, a strong working vocabulary is the best defense we have against manipulation, both commercial and political. So take, for example, the whole ballot measure business. So you've got a team of wordsmiths that are trying to come up with the perfect exact phrasing for that ballot measure. Then you've got a whole set of media working to translate that into new language. And there you are, the voter, in the booth, having to parse those words to make sure that you can accurately vote your conscience. That takes a strong vocabulary. Take, for another example, listening to a debate. We need to be able to hear and instantly recognize the motives behind choosing certain words over others. For instance, affirmative action over reverse discrimination, or illegal immigrant over undocumented worker. 
or disability over difference. The third reason, as my husband said, is that language literally defines our palette of possible thought. As Helen Keller said, perhaps more beautifully, no offense, hon, um, <laughs> um, she said, well, first she considered herself like a wild animal until she got her hands on words. You know, she first learned Braille and then she learned to sign and then finally she could vocalize. And she said, language sets thoughts astir and keeps us in the intellectual company of man. And I learned this for myself in 1993. I came out to California from Philadelphia and I started grad school at night to get a master's in English Lit. And my first professor was a guy named Michael Krasny who you might know, you know, uh, from, from public radio. Michael Krasny is a lucid, articulate man. And I will tell you that in three months of those classes, he introduced us to concepts as far and wide as cognitive dissonance and schadenfreude and intentional fallacy, agnosticism, relativism, solipsism. And those concepts that he drew with an architect's precision, with that uncanny verbal acumen of his, are now mine. They are in my palette of possible thoughts forever. And fourth, which is my favorite reason, having a strong vocabulary allows you to do the thing that 50 plus years of social science tells us is the key to well-being. Make meaningful connections to others. The strength of our connections, the quality of our connections, totally hinges on our emotional intelligence. And EQ starts with words. How accurately and unambiguously can we identify and distinguish and convey our feelings to another? Was the lie insidious or was it shrewd? Did it make you anxious or cautious? Language allows for that potent, divine moment between friends when we both understand and are understood the exactly moment where I say, I don't know, it was just, I was so I was disappointed, but it was more than that. You were disillusioned, exactly. That's exactly how I felt. And so, word nerds, <laughs> our job is clear. Only, only a TED, do you get, an, do you get a clap for sit, calling everybody a nerd? Um, our job is to go out there and help our families and our spouses and ourselves, our workplaces, our electorate, our communities, read more so that we may be able to achieve and evaluate, to think and connect, so that we might keep building the bridge that E.M. Forrester said is so essential the one between the prose in us and the passion. Without it, he said, we are meaningless fragments, half monks, half beasts. Thank you.